So you're minding your own business, you're coming out of a store, you've just had a good shopping spree, and you're walking to your car. And all of a sudden, as you start to get in your car, somebody jumps behind you, grabs you, forces you in the car, and is trying to car kidnap you. What can you do to defend yourself? What level of force can you use? We're going to talk about it today on Black Belt Life. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Black Belt Life. I'm Darren Myers, and I thank you for joining us today for this very hot topic on the use of force in self-defense. And there's a lot going on in the world today, a lot of crazy things happening, and understanding what you can do in a self-defense situation is, is really important. So today we're going to talk about it. And if you like what you see, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button on the bottom of the screen, uh, and you'll be, uh, we'll let you know about everything that's going on uh, when we upload videos and when we, when we go live. So thanks for joining us today. So let's get into this very controversial topic, okay? And please understand that I am not trying to take any political sides on any of these issues that are going on, and I'm not trying to discuss any of the latest incidents or cases in Involving the use of force. I am attempting to give you my views and knowledge of the laws of self-defense as I understand them from my 47 years of experience as a martial arts and self-defense uh, or self-defense uh, defensive tactics instructor. Can't even say it. I am also not a lawyer and do not profess to be an expert in all the laws of self-defense, but I can give you my views of how you can use self-defense and still be protected, okay, legally as well as from a self-defense uh, aspect. Also, laws can vary greatly from state to state, so yours may be different to some degree. So make sure you check out your own laws as well. Now, I'm going to divide this into two parts, one to talk about law enforcement and the other uh, to talk about civilians, uh, because that's, you know, probably the majority of people that are watching today. So let's look at the levels of force. Now, in law enforcement circles, this is called the force continuum. It describes the level of force a person can use in relation to the amount of force being used against them. So first I want to show you this in relation to law enforcement. So this first model is the use of force model used by the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And what it shows you that is that the subject, what their action is on the left-hand side there, and there, there's some sort of confrontation, okay? The officer shows up and there is officer presence there basically he can control the situation pretty much by showing up and just by talking to him okay then it goes to a um a more resistant attitude maybe uh and we'll talk about it but the officer then tries more uh more controls that might be having to do with contact okay um and then the person becomes resistant okay at that point officer has to apply compliance techniques and maybe uh put them in handcuffs then they can become assaultive they become aggressive they try to inflict bodily harm upon the officer and their defensive tactics have to be used and we'll talk about them more uh as we go along and then finally, they get, it gets to serious bodily harm and deadly attacks, deadly force, and lethal force uh, is put against the officer, and therefore, deadly force has to use back. So we're going to talk about each one. Now, the, uh, the first level is where the only force necessary is the presence of the officer and then the officer using verbal commands. Now think about it, the officer shows up, got this pretty cool car with all the lights and that kind of stuff. They're in full uniform, they got their badge, they got their cool utility belt, and of course they have their sidearm. That's enough to make most law-abiding citizens 
sit up straight, okay, quit, quit yelling and screaming or whatever the problem may be, and come to attention because we don't want to get in trouble. And there is where the officer can come in. They can be very uh, cooperative with everybody. They can be very polite with everybody to try to get everything taken care of. And this is the situation what the officer would li like to, of course, most, most of the time be in. Now, unfortunately, people who are not law-abiding citizens, they don't care. They don't care if police show up. They don't care about law. They don't care about common decency, things like that. So you have that uh, segment of the population that is not going to care that the officer is there. They're going to continue on with what, whatever is going on. But at this point, the offender is obedient, cooperative, non-aggressive, and very compliant to whatever the officer says and, and needs them to do. The next level is the resistant passive level, and this is where people start to get into trouble, all right? Uh, they're not following the officer's commands. They're maybe resisting his directions, or, you know, he might be saying you need to go over here, and they're not doing it. They're still fussing at somebody else. They're making threatening gestures, maybe disturbing the peace, that type of thing. This gets to the point where the officer may have to restrain a person with a set of those pretty bracelets he's got as well as maybe physically separate people, like put somebody in a police car to isolate them from the other folks, uh, just to get the situation under control so he can figure out what's going on and arrest the correct people and, and, and so forth. Now, as things escalate to the active resistance level, the person is now opposing or battling the officer. So they are pulling away, they're kicking at the officer, they're you know trying not to be arrested or, or uh, detained, and they don't want to do what the officer wants, and they're using force to uh, resist that officer. Officer now has to use compliance techniques in order to subdue, maybe even ground stun, which means throw them to the ground, and cuff that perpetrator. This could range from restraining locks and holds all the way up to maybe punches and kicks in order to restrain the offender and protect the officer and the victims. It may also lead to OC or pepper spray uh, at this level. And if uh, and this is the type of level where, like I said, things can get really bad. At all times, though, you got to understand the officer is trying to de-escalate the situation. He's trying to calm everybody down. He's trying to get everybody separated and everybody calm so he can figure out what's going on in that situation. So, unfortunately, people are not always cooperative and they will escalate things up. Now, if things escalate to the assaultive stage where the wrongdoer is physically aggressively attacking the officer with an immediate threat of injury to the officer, the victims, or even himself, uh, and threatening bodily harm with, and maybe using non-lethal weapons, then stronger defensive tactics and weapons may be employed if compliance techniques have failed to work. So at this point, the strongest non-lethal force is applied, and that may be with a baton, with an asp, and even with an electronic uh, control weapon, which is basically a taser, all right? Then the final stage is when there's an imminent threat of serious bodily harm or death to the victims or the officer. And the officer will constantly, like I said, go through all these levels trying to de-escalate the situation. But when it gets to this level and there's no other way to prevent the lethal assault, then deadly force must be used to stop the perpetrator. Now, the next chart is the what's called the PPCT force continuum chart, which is what I was trained in to become a defensive tactics instructor. And this chart, it further divides the resistance into uh, six levels instead of five, but it's basically the same thing. So you have where there's physical intimidation by the perpetrator. They are trying to, um, uh, have an having, they're having an argument or they're uh, trying to in intimidate somebody, trying to make them uh, you know, feel less or trying to get them to do something that uh, is illegal. 
And the officer presence, again, the officer coming in and just showing up, a lot of times will dispel a lot of situations. Then you have verbal noncompliance. Now, once the officer trust, starts to tell people what to do and people start to not comply with that, do not comply with those directions, then things uh, get a little worse. So now they're becoming passive resistant. In other words, they are not trying to hurt anybody, but they're not following the officer's directions. And maybe the officer is trying to pick them up and they're pulling away, okay? Maybe their officer's trying to put them in cuffs and they're, you know, trying to pull their hands back so the officer can't do that. Now he has to use some soft, empty hand techniques. So he might use wrist locks. He might use holds, uh, come-alongs in order to try to get the person under control. Then there comes defensive resistance, and this is where the person is pushing away, kicking at the officer, trying to get, keep distance between them and the officer to keep the officer from putting them under arrest or you know putting them in cuffs. At this point, it may turn into a bit stronger situation where hard, empty hand techniques are used, like punches and kicks and so forth, in order to subdue this person. And then that goes up to an active aggression where this person is coming at them, they are coming at them hard, and they are giving it all they've got to try to hurt that officer. They're not there trying to just get away. They're trying to do something to hurt that officer or hurt the victims. And at that point, intermediate weapons can be used, and the, uh, the perpetrator may have weapons as well. And finally, you get to defense deadly force assaults. And in those situations, of course, the person is actively trying to use some sort of weapon like a knife, a gun, something like that. Uh, and it could even be a, a club or something to inflict serious, serious bodily harm or death upon the officer. And at this point, there is nothing else that the officer can do but uh, try, try their best to avoid it. But deadly force is going to be used in that situation. Okay, so a lot of that is, relates to the civilian world, okay? And the, in the civilian world, we are looked at kind of the same way in that and, and we want to try to use only the amount of force necessary to combat and stop the attack, stop that perpetrator. The thing is, uh, as civilians, we have the choice of whether or not to interact with that person, okay, or with that threat. Uh, where a police officer, they don't have that choice. They are sworn to serve and protect. And they have to show up, they have to confront the threat, and they have to get things in order. So they have to put themselves in harm's way constantly and confront the threat. We. As civilians, we can just walk away if we, if we have that opportunity. We can run, okay? Whatever we can do to simply avoid the threat, okay? Maintaining a, live, a level of situational awareness can allow us that option to do that, if possible. So when in doubt, get out. Now, having the ability to assess a threat by being situationally aware it takes training and it becomes a physical uh, conflict. And, and, you know, seeing a physical conflict starting or seeing a situation building, seeing things that are possible that might happen, that takes training, practice, and alertness. You've got to be alert. You can't be on that cell phone all the time when you're out in public. This is by far your greatest deterrent to any violent encounter be aware. Be aware of what's going on around you. See it before it happens, and then you can avoid the situation. Now, if there are visual indicators that are suspicious, all right, and yes, this uh, is almost like, you know, we're trying to profile people, all right, but, you know, if you're in a restaurant and you're, you know, enjoying your food and that kind of stuff and you see somebody walk in and it's a man and his wife and family, okay, that they're fine, no problem. You see a guy walk in, he's got a hoodie on and he's got his hoodie up, he's got his hands in his pocket and he's kind of looking around, okay. Okay, yes, we're profiling because it's July, he shouldn't have a hoodie on, right? 
well, we're looking around. He's looking around. That is profiling. And yes, in order to be situationally aware, you kind of have to profile people. All right. And that may not be the socially acceptable way of doing things, but to be aware of what's going on around you and the people around you, you have to take things for granted that that could be a bad situation. So you just keep your eye on them. And if you have some sort of indicators that, you know, somebody looks suspicious or whatever, you're walking through a parking lot, you see this guy and he's kind of eyeing you, well, present a confident demeanor back by standing tall, eyeing that person. Don't look away from them. Eye them. Look at them, okay, with a, with a stare that means don't mess with me, all right? Maybe even speaking to them. You know, you walk by and you go, hey, how you doing? Or, hey, how you doing? Now he knows he's, he's on your radar. He knows that you are aware of his presence, and therefore, he's not going to be able to surprise you. So maybe he'll pick on somebody else or maybe not pick on anybody at all. Okay. Your physical presence of self-confidence and determination may be enough to make them think twice about approaching you. They're not going to want to approach somebody that's ready for them, that's able to, looks like they're able to defend themselves. They're looking for a victim that's unaware and looks like an easy target. Don't be an easy target. When the perpetrator gives you verbal indicators such as threats, slurs, or even inappropriate communication, okay, try to deflect their assault with words or silence in an effort to defuse the situation. Rather than trying to incite things further and causing more problems, this is still a level of no injury to either party. So, you know, as long as nothing's happened between you and he's just mouthed off or whatever and insulted you, just let it go. Let it roll, okay? Just keep going and don't worry about it, all right? Now, you might want to keep an eye on that kind of person, though, because, you know, they might continue to follow you and, and uh, come in. At that point, you either want to head straight to somebody who's going to help you, like, uh, security guard or something like that or you might want to turn around and say back off all right so put that person again on notice and we'll talk more about that in upcoming videos now the threat of injury is no longer a problem it's a crime so if somebody threatens you and say, says they're going to hurt you that's a crime all right if that per person threatens you that's assault if they touch you it's battery now is when reasonable force can be applied in an effort to stop the threat. Now, once a threat no longer exists, once you've taken care of business, you have to stop applying force to the perpetrator. Now, that doesn't mean if you have him pinned that you let him up, uh, but you can't continue to pummel him with your coubaton or your reverse punch or whatever. This is where non-lethal self-defense weapons can be used as well. Okay, things such as pepper spray, tasers, uh, tack bows, keychains, ropes, blunt force tools, etc. Depending on the level of force they came at you with. Again, it's got to be somewhat equal. They come at you with this amount of force, you can take it a little tiny bit higher depending on your situation. Most of these weapons and things, however, require some training and you should seek that out in order to be able to use them effectively. Now, last is deadly force. We're, we're in imminent threat of serious injury or death. Martial art techniques and weapons of destruction, such as guns or knives, may be the last and only resort in these situations. Only you can be the judge of that, of whether your life is or is not in peril. Remember, you have to be in immediate, imminent danger for fear, and you're in fear for your life and it's, it's something that's immediately going to happen in order to defend yourself with deadly force. Keep in mind that levels of force can vary significantly due to many factors. Age, gender, size, okay? All these things can change the necessary levels of force that can be used in many situations. For instance, if a small woman, if she's attacked by a large man, 
It may require jumping up more than one level of force to dispel the attack because she's not going to be able to use the same amount of force that he's using against her in order to uh, ward him off. She has to use something stronger, uh, some, uh, attack more vital points. She has to use something that's going to give her an edge above that man's uh, natural strength and size uh, in order to dispel the attack. Okay? Um, a person's lack of self-defense skills, that might possibly necessitate the use of non, um, a non-lethal weapon to stop an attack. Okay? So, for instance, somebody who doesn't have any skills they're not in shape they're not ready you know physically for that type of thing they have may have to resort to some sort of weapon pepper spray uh taser etc even when somebody's coming at them with a fairly you know small level of force in order to get away from that level of force they may have to use something uh, that's uh, a bit higher on the scale in order to get away from them um and, and, and especially children okay if a child is attacked or if there's an like an attempted abduction by an adult or something like that that's going to constitute a much higher level of self-defense because that child does not have the strength does not have the size to defend themselves against an adult so they're going to have to try to use uh tactics that are much higher uh and in order to try to get away from that adult so there are many factors that can change the amount of force necessary to reduce the immediate threat. Now, all citizens, all of us, have the right to protect ourselves from harm to keep our family safe. But you must use an appropriate amount of force to be legally safe. Police are protected to an extent by legislation from criminal or civil prosecution. Citizens, on the other hand, can face criminal charges or maybe even worse be sued by an assailant for using excessive force and you lose everything you've got as martial artists we are somewhat looked at by the courts as trained fighters kind of similar with police officers so the courts look at us in a self-defense scenario as being able to handle ourselves and you know, thwart an attack without using an excessive amount of force. So here's, you know, this guy that attacks you and you're like, all right, I can take this guy, okay? And you, you punch him, you take him down. Now you want to put him into a double wrist lock and you want to flip him over and you want to put your knee on his back and then you want to punch him and then you want to stop and you can't do all that. Yes, you've been trained to be able to do all that, but you can only use the amount of force necessary to stop the attack. So if you block that guy hard and he goes, oh, dude, man, I'm not messing with you, it's over. You can't punch him. You can't kick him, okay? If he stops in his, his attack just because you block him nice and strong, the attack's over. The, the whole situation is over, and if you continue it, you're going to be in trouble. All right. Now, I hope this gives you some food for thought and some mental exercise in what you can do in a situation like this. Um, it's it's not an easy, you know, there's there's not a way that we know every single possibility of what can happen and what the results and the consequences are going to be. Uh, but next week, we're going to have a very special guest to talk about this from the legal side. I've invited attorney Andrew Page from Randall Page Law Firm to be here to talk with us about how the laws work in a self-defense situation. That's right, folks. You're going to hear it from an expert in the field. So join us here next week on Black Belt Life. If you like our content, please hit the like button and give us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Uh, notice how I did that? Okay, it's down there. It's, it's down there. It really is. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, that way, uh, you're going to be notified when we go live for, with more content and upload new videos. And thank you for watching and supporting our channel. And remember our dojo ethics, that karate begins and ends with respect. And we are responsible for our behavior at all times. And all of our actions have consequences, good or bad. There is no excuse 
for bad manners. Be nice to people. And we lead by example. Thanks so much. See you next week on Black Belt Life.